March is always something that makes me think about first moving from California to Boise, Idaho in 1994. We moved here in March, and so it was like 26 years ago. And, uh, you know, it it was one of those things that at first, you know, we came from Rancho Cordova, where we literally would hear helicopters at night behind the apartments where there was, like, drug deals going on, you know. I mean, that's the sort of place that we had lived in California. We came here, and the first thing we noticed is that parents were letting their kids play out in the front yard. We thought they were crazy, you know. (laughs) These parents don't care about their kids. What's the deal? Well, it was soon after that that, you know, we hit the summer, and about 6.30, almost every morning in the summer, we get this, this knock on the door, you know. And it was Zach, the kid across the street. He was like five years old. Can Justin come out and play? You know, and so, so we <laughs> he just got used to this going on in the summer. Well, it turned out that Zach, his mom was a single mom. And she sort of had a reputation in the community among the other women in the you know. That, you know, she wasn't that great of a parent, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, all of this stuff that just bad rumors. And, 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 you know, I just saw her one day. And one day I just, I I just, I was, I just like, go invite her to your, to her service. And I I almost sort of like argued with the Lord about, oh, she wouldn't be interested. You know, it's like, just ask her, you know. So I, I took one of our little invitation flyer things and. We were meeting at Sunday nights at the time at the BSU uh, Student Union building. And so, so I just said, hey, you know, we, started, we came here to start a church. And, you know, would you like to come? And, and she goes, oh, she goes, I have been looking for a church. I would love to come. And she started coming and she came to our home Bible study. And not too long after that, uh, she said she, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And so, um, so we prayed for her. And you know, God healed her. He healed her. Uh, he, you know, and she ended up marrying this guy, this Christian guy. They moved like in eastern Idaho. And just the Lord just began to just bless her abundantly. And it, but it was just one of those things that it just, it, it ministered to me that, hey, you know, you never know who I'm going to reach. You just be faithful. Because oftentimes it's the people that you would think would not have an interest in the gospel of Jesus Christ that really are the closest to receiving him. And so what's important for us is just simply to be available to the Lord and, and listen to him when he prompts us, you know, to, to talk to others about him. And so I, I, I say that because as we're continuing today, we're in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, and we see last week that Jesus had uh, been teaching in this house, and it was so crowded that nobody could even get in. And then these guys, they had four guys, they had a friend who was paralyzed, and he was, you know, like on a mat. And so uh, they wanted to bring him to Jesus, to to have Jesus heal him. And and, uh, and so they couldn't find a way, and so they lowered him through the roof. <laughs> Went upstairs, you know, up on top of the roof, lowered him in. And, and as soon as Jesus saw him, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And, of course, the Pharisees had a problem with that because it's like, well, who is this guy think he is that he can forgive sins? And, and he said, okay, so you can know that I have power to forgive sins. Watch this. In the name of, you know, I, I command you, get up and, and, and walk. You know, and the guy gets up. And uh, he's not paralyzed anymore. He walks and everybody's freaking out. It's like, wow, you know, this is amazing. We haven't seen anything like that. So then Jesus leaves the house. And we're told, Mark tells us that he actually went out to the Sea of Galilee. It was in Capernaum, which is right on the the Sea of Galilee. And and he began to teach the people. And they came out and listened to him. Um, And so, and after that, this is where we pick it up. Verse 9. Now, as Jesus passed from there... He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now, you got to understand, this is not like you're very much beloved IRS worker, okay? (laughs) The tax collectors in these days were despised by the people. And, And there was good reason for that. 
Now, it is interesting that actually his name, according to both Mark and Luke, uh, his name that he was going by at this point was Levi. Levi means attached. And, you know, it's one of the sons of Jacob, but it means attached. And, and uh, it seems that after he became a follower of Jesus, he changed his name to Matthew, which means gift of Yahweh or gift of Jehovah. And, uh, and so that became sort of his, his, now his Christian name, if you will, uh, by which he would, he would go by. But, um, but at this point, you know, he was a tax collector sitting at the tax office And the way it worked is that he would have been employed by what was called a farming contractor. Okay, what happened is Rome would hire these contractors and their farm was the area where they had to collect taxes. Now, these guys many times were foreign to the actual province where they were collecting taxes. So they would have a local person who knew the people uh, and... Could, could make sure that they were actually collecting the taxes because, you know, the, the contractor wouldn't really know the people, wouldn't know if they're lying to him or not, you know. And so, so Matthew was one of these local guys who was Jewish, you know, hence his name was Levi, okay, but uh, was considered a traitor because ultimately he was working for Rome. He was working for a contractor that, you know, had a contract with Rome. And so... Uh, but the problem was this, this tax collecting system was open to abuse so that tax collectors were prone to use extortion and, and malpractice and um, basically uh, just <laughs> collect more than what they were supposed to collect uh, and pocket the, the rest. And so they became especially despised and considered to be Turncoats, traitors, you know, by their fellow Jews. So this is the kind of... Now, if you're trying to put together what you think is going to be a politically correct team of disciples, okay, (laughs) you would never choose Levi, okay? And this is just one of those things where you realize that God's ways are not our ways, okay? Now, think about this from, from Levi or Matthew's perspective, you know? He, this was probably not the first time that he had heard of Jesus. I mean, this Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters. Matthew is no dummy. He, in fact, he had to make it his job to know what was going on locally in the city. And so, and so he was no doubt very much aware of what Jesus was doing and probably figured, like so many people who know that they're sinners, they know that they're, you know, if they ever should dare come into the, the you know, darken the doors of a church, and they'd probably be thrown out, you know. That's the way a lot of people feel, that, you know, they know they're sinners, and they, they, he probably saw this holy man and thought, man, I, you know, I could never have anything to do with him. And that's, that's the way it is a lot of times. And I think it, the fact that Jesus would come to him, and even say, hey, you, you, I know about you, you know, it doesn't matter. I want you to come and follow me. You follow me. And, you know, not only was it one of those things where Jesus was just, you know, asking him to, to be, you know, one of the multitude, but he was actually asking him to be one of his inner circle, one of his disciples, ultimately one of the apostles. And, uh, and you know, that's the thing about it is that I think maybe sometimes we, we don't quite understand the fact that it is God's goodness, it's his grace, it's his undeserved favor towards sinners like us that causes us to want to follow him. When we realize that, you know, as Matthew must have, that you know, I don't deserve this. I know who I am. But he still loves me. He still wants me on his team, you know. And I think that that, that reality that God desires you, no matter what you've done, no matter, no matter how much of a sinner you feel you are, you know, you're actually the one the Lord wants to join with him. 
And he can change all that. He's willing to change all that. He's willing to accept you right where you're at. And that's, that's what this, this means to me. Is, is, uh, and, and, and so what a wonderful thing. I think, you know, for, for Levi, who is really attached to this world, if you will, to change his name to Gift of Yahweh. First off, he received the Gift of Yahweh, <laughs> which was grace. But then secondly, you know, Jesus, you know, he chose Matthew. Now, Matthew probably would have had uh, a good understanding about good accounting practices, right? He'd have to. And so he would end up being a very good chronicler of the, the words and the deeds of Jesus, which, of course, this gospel. So see, see, this is what I mean. Here's somebody that most of us probably would have written off as a possibility for even being part of the kingdom of God. And yet Jesus called him, used his gifts, he became the author of this gospel, and how many people have been blessed for 2,000 years as a result of him following Jesus, you see? And that's why we just don't understand, we don't get the fact that God's ways are not our ways. And many times the very people that we would just never think to, to pick are the ones that he chooses. Uh, and so, so that's what happened. Now, um, it says, verse 10, that it happened as Jesus sat at the table in his house. Okay, now we are told, Luke tells us that, that it was actually Matthew's house that you know, Matthew invited Jesus to come over. And behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So, um, you know, Matthew, he, he, this was, this, he knew he was going to make a huge change. And he had all these friends. Obviously, they were tax collector friends. These were his co-workers and sinners. And this was sort of his farewell party, <laughs> you know? This idea, I'm, I'm leaving my profession now. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. And, uh, and I want to say goodbye, but not only do I want to say goodbye, I want you to be introduced to this one that I'm following, see? And so Matthew was real smart because it's like he, he used the opportunity that he had with his sinful friends to, to introduce them to Jesus, to be a witness to them, and to give them the opportunity. Because they'd have a lot of questions. He would know that. You know, you know if, if you've been totally uh, non-religious, okay, and you party and everything with your friends and all, and suddenly, you know, you give your life to Christ, and then God starts changing you from the inside out, and they have a lot of questions. Well, that's an opportunity for you to share why God has changed your life, how God's changed your life. And, and that, so that was why. Now, the, there's, you've heard the statistic. The, the problem is, many times, is that we lose those relationships with unbelievers. Statistically, after two years of a person being a Christian, they, they virtually have hardly any relationships with unbelievers. And that's really tragic, because what better way for... Satan to just keep people bound up in sin and on a fast track to hell, you know, uh, than to keep them isolated, you know, to keep those that are in darkness isolated from those who are in light. See? So, so Matthew was smart here. He was smart in that he, he brought all of his friends together. He brought them with Jesus. And, of course, there are tax collectors, there are sinners and, and Jesus was right at home with these people. I love that. He was right at home. And there's nothing to indicate that these people were like, you know, freaked out by Jesus or that Jesus was judging them or anything like that. He was just 
I think loving on them, being who he was, and, uh, and eating with them. Okay, now in that culture, to eat with somebody meant that you were becoming one with them. You know, you, you break bread together, you both eat the same bread, that bread is going into you, it's going into me, we're becoming one. And that's why the Pharisees would never even go into the home of a Gentile or sinner. They would never even go into their home, let alone eat with them. And, and so this is why they would, they would have such a problem with Jesus doing this. You know, going in and eating with these tax collectors, you know. And, and so, um, so they, you know, would have a problem with that. But, but understand here that... Uh, we are, we are to love people where they're at. The Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14 that we're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, but we must not misinterpret that as thinking that we're not to be representatives of Christ to them or not have a relationship with them. That's not what it's talking about. Uh, and so, um, remember, Paul also said that he had become all things to all people so that through all means he may save some. His purpose was to be like them as much as he could uh, in order to, to be able to present Jesus to them in a way that they could understand. And so, that's what you see Jesus doing. Now, now I think it is impossible to save people without having a relationship with him. Or you cannot save the one you hate the most. Okay? (laughs) You have to have a loving relationship with somebody. Or just be a good friend, you know? In order to have a hope, really, uh, uh, of saving them. Or as Abraham Lincoln said, if you want to win somebody to your cause, then convince them that you are their sincere friend. Okay? Okay? That's what Jesus was doing here. And, uh, and so, but it's risky. Now, I think, I think of the medical workers who are helping people with the coronavirus. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, many have endangered their own lives. Many in China, a huge amount actually, have died as a result of caring for the sick. There's a reality in that. There can be risk involved when you seek to minister to the sick. Now, in China, you know, many of the medical workers uh, involved in the COVID-19 response have died. Some have died of the infection. Others have died of cardiac arrest or other ailments due to overwork and fatigue. They literally exhausted themselves to death. Um, One victim was hit by a car while taking temperatures on a highway. Uh, Three doctors died in one day, all infected with COVID-19. One of them, Pen Yinhua, 29 years old, died in Wuhan of infection on February 20th. Now, he had delayed his February 1st wedding, promising his pregnant fiance that they'd have the ceremony after the outbreak had passed. And so all of this has caused this, this Chinese state media to, to say that doctors and nurses who have died while trying to contain the outbreak are officially now designated as martyrs. I think rightly so. Because they did in, endanger their lives to try to help those who are dying, you know. Sick and dying. Um, But that's, to some degree, what we are called to. That's what Jesus did. Look, he of all people, he became sin for us, for sinners like us. He died. And he said, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. So so I think that we need to understand. Look, we're not called. I get we're, 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 we should be wise and take precautions and all that. But we are not called to so self-isolate that we stop having the influence and having the relationships with people that desperately need Jesus Christ. 
And this is a huge, wonderful opportunity for we who have, who have hope to share the hope that we have found in the Lord with people that are scared. They're panicked. They've never been. None of us have been down this road before. But, but we know the one who controls everything. Amen? And we know the one that can heal where nobody else can heal. So, so anyway, um, so what did Jesus say? He said, look, when the Pharisees came to him, well, actually, they didn't even come to Jesus. They didn't have the nerve to do that. They went to Jesus' disciples. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus heard this. He said, well, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Don't you love the fact that Jesus comes to us as the great physician? And listen, the more sick you are with sin, and that's the way Jesus looks at it. Sin is a sickness of which we all have it. We've all contracted the sin sickness. Every one of us. I've, as it's been said, there's, there's, you know, there's sinners and there's sinners saved by grace. Amen? <laughs> That's it. Two people in the world. <laughs> but Jesus came to us in our sins. And listen, if you are in sin here today, if there's some area in your life that's not right, guess what? Jesus wants to reach you today in that, in that right where you're at. That's why he came. He's the doctor. Yeah, can you imagine going into the hospital and the doctor says, no, I don't want, I don't want to treat you, you're sick. What? See, that's the reason Jesus came. So, so, so he said that, and, and, and you know, what could they say to that? I love it. Um, but then he said, go and learn what this means. And they quoted Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now understand, The Pharisees were doing everything they could to keep the 613 laws of Moses. You know, they were uh, keeping themselves apart from sinners, not going into their homes and and all of that. You know, they were offering their sacrifices. They were tithing on, you know, not only their money, but also their their herbs. I mean, everything. They were doing all of this stuff to sacrifice. They were fasting. They were doing all of these things because they thought that their religious works would you know, give them favor with God. And Jesus said, look, you need to learn something. You need to learn what this means. Now, God is not looking for your sacrifice. He's looking to bestow his mercy. And I am bestowing God's mercy on these people. And you need to understand that this is what this is about. It's not about all your sacrifices and your religiosity and all that. It's about demonstrating mercy in tangible ways to people that God wants to reach. So, so it was fitting, therefore, that Jesus would be among the sinners because they were the ones who needed the gospel. But what about us? Are we letting our light shine among sinners in such a way that we are calling them to turn from their sins. Remember, Jesus said, listen, go what this means. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Why? Because I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, sinners to repentance, to a change of heart. Understand, what sin is, is death. Sin is death. What the Lord is calling us to is to turn from death and embrace his eternal life that comes through his salvation. To believe in him and to turn from that which is killing you. It's like it's like he's offered the cure. If you get the the COVID-19 disease and you and you are say in a high risk group and you think you're this is it. And they come up with the vaccine. It's some kind of a, you know, injection or whatever. I mean, how many of you would say, oh, no thanks. I want to keep my COVID-19. I'm good. I don't want the cure. Really? See, that's what sin is. It destroys. It destroys life. And Jesus says, look, you turn from that that's destroying you. You come to me. And I will give you abundant life and eternal life. That's why I have come to call sinners to repentance. 
And so, and, and, and that's, that's why he is still working through us as church to do the same thing. So are we letting our light shine among sinners in such a way that we're calling them to turn from their sins by our example, by our words, and trust in Jesus Christ? 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You talk about identification of a problem? This is Jesus, the Son of God, the Creator, who knew no sin, who dwells in unapproachable light from all of eternity past, okay? And he became sin. Every lie, every adulterous act, every rape, every murder... He became sin for you and me. He took God's judgment and wrath against sin on the cross so that you and I could be the righteousness of God in Him. You talk about identification. You don't get any more identification than that. And that's the message we have. That that's what Jesus, that's how much Jesus loves you, right where you're at. That he did that for you. And then he takes upon himself the, not only your sin, but then he gives you the, the power to live a, a righteous life for God. You see, I can't do it. Jesus understands that. But he can do it through you. That's our message. And we are his ambassadors. Therefore, <laughs> may we be strong and courageous. Amen? And do what he's called us to do. Well, verse 14. Now the disciples of John came to him and said, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved." So the disciples of John, now John the Baptist had already been arrested, okay? And, and they're coming to him, uh, well, I think he'd been arrested, maybe he wasn't arrested yet. But it's kind of curious to me that why are, they, why are they still disciples of John, okay? Because John was the one that testified, he said, you know, the one who comes after me, I'm not worthy to untie his, his sandals, Okay, and so uh, why are they coming to him? Why, why aren't they just following Jesus? They're still holding on to, to the fact that they are fasting. And they're fasting the way the Pharisees are fasting. Now understand, the only sort of fasting that, that had taken place, really, that God had commanded in the Scripture was that they fast on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. The one day out of the year when they were to to fast, because that was the day that atonement was made for their sins. You know, uh, that one day out of the year when the high priest would go into the most holy place before the Lord and make atonement for the people. Other than that, there was no commandment given for fasting. People would do it, and it was okay. God permitted it. But then sometimes they were doing the fasting, but they were still you know, sinning. And God said, I'm not going to accept that. You know, you need to do the right thing. If you want to fast that's going to please me, then do what's right. You know, but, but the fact is, is that here the Pharisees, the, the disciples of John the Baptist, they're still fasting according to this old system of religion that they've been practicing for a long, long time. And so they, so they can, well, you know, we're fasting. The, the, the Pharisees, they're fasting. Why aren't your disciples fasting, Jesus? And so he says, look, I'm the bridegroom. They're my friends. We're at, we're at the big party here. <laughs> we're at the wedding feast. Can you imagine going to the wedding feast and fasting? Do you know what a stick in the mud you would be? <laughs> right? They have this wonderful buffet and you go, I'm sorry, I'm fasting. And it's like, dude, 
You came to the wrong place. This is a time of feasting, not fasting. And so Jesus is saying, look, they're with me. How can they fast? How can they be sorrowful at a time like this? But the time will come when I will be taken away. And of course, we see that when Jesus was crucified, you know, after that, they were mourning. They were probably fasting at that point. Um, Jesus did say, you know, when you fast, so there's nothing wrong with fasting. There's a time and place for it. But uh, it wasn't at that point. And, they, and, so, and then he goes on to say, look, you need to understand something. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Now, most of us don't even repair garments anymore. This is something my grandmother did, right? How many of you are darning your socks this week, huh? Okay. <laughs> it just doesn't happen, right? You just throw it away and get a new one. Yeah, so, but back in the day, they would actually patch clothes. Uh, I, the closest I got to it was in the 70s. I would put all these weird, f- funky love patches and peace sign patches all over my jeans just for the fun of it. But even that was a step above what happens now where they, they have jeans that are all falling apart with holes in them. I don't know. I figure that. I never have figured that one. But anyway, that's another story. But in those days, right, you, you, would, you, you, you wouldn't put a, a piece of unshrunk cloth on a shrunk garment because it would all pull apart as soon as you launder it, you know. His this point is that, you know, that you can't do that. You can't take something new and sew it onto something old and expect it to work out. And then he said the same thing with wineskins, okay? You know, you've got... Wine skins. Now they would take literally. They would take the skin of a of an animal, wrap it up, you know, close up all the openings, and you know, seal that up, and pour their their new wine into it. And and the elasticity of that of that hide would, as the, as the wine is fermenting, you know, it would stretch and everything, and, and it would be fine, and it would keep it sealed. It was a watertight container. Um, and so, but if it had once been stretched and then it had been used for that purpose before, if you tried to put new wine in it again, it would just burst, okay? It couldn't handle it because it already stretched out. And so he so, so this is understand. This is the new wine. I have a new wine. I have a, I have a new work of God that I am doing. And we know that John said in his gospel that, that with Moses came the law, but with Jesus came grace and truth. Amen? This is the new wine. There's a new work. Folks, listen. I fully expect God to do a new work. I, I fully expect that God's story for our nation does not end with a coronavirus and that's it. Everybody dies. Done. The end. I do not believe that is God's story for us. Amen? I believe God is writing a story for us that is awesome and wonderful, that he wants to do a fresh new work through his church in this nation because we need it. And we have a lot of people praying for that, and I believe it's going to happen. I believe this is, like I said, I believe there's a, whatever, God uses, God is going to use it for good, but just like Satan came and, and brought disease and disaster against Job, I believe he's seeking to bring disease and disaster against our nation and fear, heavy-duty fear, to try to thwart what it is that God wants to do. But God wants to pour out new wine upon this nation and upon us as a church. And the thing is, is that we can either be those old wineskins that, well, this is the way we do it here. <laughs> the way we've always done it is we're going to do it. You know, and what's going to happen? You're going to burst because you won't be able to handle what it is that God is doing. This was the point Jesus is making. Look, you can't take these old systems that they, they were good at one time, but they're incapable of handling the fresh work that God is doing. And so we can't be those old wine systems. Now, it has nothing to do with age, by the way. I mean, you know, people say, well, you know, they're... They're set in their ways. What about Nicodemus, okay? Think about Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. He was probably an old Pharisee, you know? One of the elders. He was part of the Sanhedrin, so he's probably an older guy. 
And, uh, you know, and, and, and he came to Jesus at night and he said, well, hey, you know, we've been watching you and nobody could be doing what you're doing except God's with them. And, and Jesus looked at him and said, listen, unless you're born again, you shall not see the kingdom of heaven. What do you mean I need to be born again? I can't go back into the womb of my mother another time. What are you talking about? No, no, no. You need to be born of the spirit. You know, that which is of flesh is flesh. That which is of the spirit is spirit. And then, and then he said, um, well, he pointed Nicodemus back to something. Do you remember back in the wilderness when the people began to murmur and complain? You know, they, they'd been doing this a lot. But this time, God sent these poisonous serpents in. And he began to bite the people. <laughs> And, and then as soon as they get bitten, and, and they, some of them start to die. Okay, this is a plague of poisonous snakes. And, and so they cry out to Moses, Moses, we're sorry, we've sinned, you know, we've intercede to God for, you know. <laughs> and he said, too bad. Uh, no, he didn't. He didn't say that. He probably felt like it, but he didn't say it. He, he, he prayed, and God said, okay, Moses, what you do? You know, you, you, you craft a serpent, make it out of bronze, you put it on a pole, and if the people will just look at that, they will be healed. If they'll just look at it in faith, I will heal them. So, so, so here's Jesus having this conversation with Nicodemus. This guy, he's well steeped in the Old Testament. And, and Jesus says, okay, Nicodemus, here's the deal. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then, of course, the next verse is, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here he takes this guy, who is really by by all, you know, understanding would would be considered probably like an old wineskin. But he says, here's the deal. You see this? You see, you see that what happened in the, in the wilderness? That was just a picture. It's a picture of me. Because just as that serpent was lifted up, so I will be lifted up. I will be lifted up on the cross. I will become sin. That, that serpent on the pole, see, that's me. I will become sin. But here's the deal. If anybody will just look at me in faith, they will be healed. See, Jesus took this old guy and he, t- he taught the old dog new tricks, okay? And of course, Nicodemus would become his disciple. So it's not about age. It's about the willingness to receive the, the fresh work of God's grace, of being supple enough and flexible enough and, and yielded enough, surrendered enough to say, God, okay, here I am, you know. Let me be open to, to the new thing you want to do and, and yielded to it. Um, and so that's, that's what I believe he was trying to teach <laughs> these people that came to him. You know, they were good. You know, these are John the Baptist's disciples. But he says, look, you got to understand, you know, there's, there's a new work here. And you can't expect the old systems to handle it. It won't. You've got to be flexible. And so, I'd like to just um, close with um, a famous quote by uh, Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a missionary in the 50s who reached out to the uh, Waorani people of Ecuador. Any of you probably... Uh, heard that there's actually a movie, I think it's even on Netflix, called The End of the Spear. If you've never had a chance to see that, great movie about his life. But uh, he died as a martyr there in 1956. Uh, but one of his famous quotes is, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You know, he was willing to lay his life down on the mission field for these people who ultimately did uh, become Christians. And his wife, Elizabeth Elliot, 
continue to live there among the, the, those Ecuadorian, that tribe, with, his, with their daughter um, for many years and continued the ministry that, that Jim had begun. But it, it's always spoken to me of a willingness of a person to lay it all on the line, realizing that the greatest thing that you can do is to live for eternity and not be scared. Not be scared. You know, that's not coming from the Lord. Yeah, we'd be wise. I get that. But we don't be panicked. We live for Jesus and we make use of the opportunities because there's a lot of Levi's out there that need to become Matthews. Amen? And they're in your path or in my path. There's a lot of sinners there, and Jesus is a great physician, and he wants you, you know, to be his nurse <laughs> and, and go and minister to them right where they're at. Love on them. Give them hope. This is a great opportunity for the gospel. Amen? Amen. One last quote I'll throw at you. I came across it yesterday. I thought this is really great. By A.W. Tozier. A scared world needs a fearless church. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your presence. We do thank you, Lord, that you came and invaded our lives when we least deserved it, Jesus. And you, you revealed your, your love for us and your ability and willingness to forgive us and give us a fresh start, Lord. And for many of us, that has happened many, many times. And we're so grateful, Lord, for what you've you've done in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that we would, we would echo that, Lord, that we would be your ambassadors to a, to a needy world, Lord. Right now, there's definitely an, a lot of opportunity for us to share the hope that is in us. And Lord, the, the fact that, Lord, just even as people looked upon that serpent and they were healed, Lord, I pray that there would be many healings of people that have this virus, Lord, that that you could even use us to bring them to you, Jesus, and that, that you would bring miraculous healings in the lives of people and that you would show yourself faithful and able to cure every disease and especially the disease of sin. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.